Hey, friends. So I've continued to listen to The Scandal of God, which is this amazing book by Alan Jones, who I, I've been talking about this book on my post for, uh, oh, it's probably been about a week or so, but um, I'm still in it. And I have to say, it's it's it keeps it keeps just surprising me with the level of insight that is that is that it's um revealing he the the essence of the book is is sort of i mean it's really hard to sum up but i would say that i think the um the essence of the book is a kind of diagnosis of fundamentalism in all its forms in other words not simply the religious fundamentalism that we all kind of know and see but also what i think you know alan might call atheistic the fundamentalism of an of the of, of an atheist worldview or the fundamentalism of a scientific worldview um because any of those domains this is the thing that's kind of blowing my mind. You know, he's he's done such a good job of delineating how any domain and and really any um, form of inquiry, any form of knowledge, has to happen within a narrative. We have to create a narrative structure for our way of knowing the world, which is exactly what the previous book that I just listened to was all about and that keeps coming up in Alan's book and um so and because that's true something like science is not immune from fundamentalism because fundamentalism is is simply the 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 refusal to acknowledge that there are open questions and that there are things that we can't know. Fundamentalism basically closes the door on doubt. It closes the door on the unknown. And in so doing, it closes the door on the conversation that would continue to evolve our perspective and our, and our insight. Um, and that is completely possible within, within scientific, with a scientific uh, worldview. It's called scientism. The sort of idea that only the truths of science are that the, the truths of science are the really real truths. All other truths are subsidiary, and and it's a it's a complete privileging. And if and I don't need to go into it right now, but there's a there's a there's a way in which it's as almost it's as arbitrary a selection of valid data points as it is to say that religion or my God is the only real God. There's a bit more sophistication sometimes happening on the scientific side, but ultimately the selection, the decision, and the sort of by fiat de declaring that this set of data points is the really real one is equally arbitrary, whether it's, in, whether it's a, happening in the scientific world or in a religious superstitious world. Um, so that's been a fascinating thing to, to watch Alan really kind of tease out the details of and, um, and really paint a very compelling picture about how this works and you know and what we what we really ought to be doing to keep that to keep the conversation open to and to allow these different dimensions of of our of our human exploration to talk to each other one of the things that has come up in the last chapter that i've listened to which i'm in chapter six now is this idea in the, and this comes directly out of the fact that all human meaning takes place within a narrative. All human meaning is narrative in some ways. That's how we connect 
strings of, of experiences, strings of data points. They, need, they require a narrative in order to hang together and add up to meaning. And this is where, um, you know, basically in this most recent little section of the, of the book that I've been reading, Alan talks about that narrative, that, that meaning-making narrative by another name is culture. And, and culture it is essentially a shared narrative. It's shared meaning, shared forms of meaning-making. And one of the things that he has been kind of unpacking in, in chapter six is the way that we conceive of freedom as being completely individualistic, especially in America. This is kind of our thing. We think that freedom means me. Freedom means I get to do whatever I want to do. And so, and that ideal, that the idea that the individual capacity for autonomous self-expression, self-actualization, really kind of with unfettered by responsibility to a group or inhibited by collective concerns has created a pretty unhealthy culture. We, we, are, we are really running away headlong from the foundation of, of, of not just personal individual meaning, but shared meaning that, that actually creates a, a society to begin with. So in other words, it, it's one thing to say, to talk about freedom within a society, it's another, but, but the fact is all we, we know, every single one of us knows that our freedom, even the freedom of a billionaire, the freedom of the of the of the richest human being on earth only exists in the context of an agreement that their wealth has value right we we have to ha there there are certain fundamental agreements that and that's almost like just a thought experiment to to reveal the sort of obvious but sometimes not so obvious fact that freedom only exists in connection there is no other freedom there is no fully autonomous freedom and and that's why as an ideal the the even even if it's not even if we even if we're not like literally intellectually convinced that that ultra autonomy hyper autonomy is what is 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 freedom that just the notion just our kind of erroneous notion that that's what we're striving for just the notion that we're reaching for something that's ultimately all about liberating the self the individual starts to have a corrosive effect on the the very foundational agreements that make it possible for an individual to be free and so basically what alan is arguing for is a is a kind of emphasis a re-emphasis on the connections on human connection human community as the fabric of life, of conscious life. And of course, within that fabric, we want to make room for individual liberty and, and individual autonomy, individual self-expression. Nobody's saying that we need to do away with that or even really have less of that. It's just I, I feel like what Alan is advocating is a is for a kind of recollection of of what that 
of, of the context in which that autonomy takes place. The shared context, the in, inevitably shared context. I mean, like right now, we have individual countries, individual states, and, and individual human beings all jockeying for leverage, for power, for advantage, in, an, in, an, in, in, in the sense of an energy, I mean, you can't quite call it a war, although in some places on the globe it is a war, within the context of a planet that's overheating. How, what, who, if, if we if, talk, about, talk about missing the forest for the trees, the shared context of the planet ought to be of concern to everyone. It is of concern to everyone. It is inevitably going to unite us in our experience, if not in our interpretation of the events, it will unite us in the experience of ongoing human life on this planet. But we're kind of missing it, and we're and we're we're we, we're sort of we seem convinced that an individ that that preserving our own individual little bailiwick within this you know scary changing world might somehow work out that we might somehow make it that way get away with it and so you know i mean I, and that's kind of on like a very global scale and alan is you know the, the way that alan is um both describing and really kind of i mean he talks about the role of religion for example in this the role of religion as one of the narratives that emphasizes the collective. That's inherently what what religion does. It's it's old. Most most traditions are old enough that that emphasis was explicit. Now, ironically, the inclusivity of a mythological religion very often is almost synonymous with its exclusivity. In other words, the believers belong and the unbelievers don't. And I think that's why many people with a kind of contemporary scientifically aware consciousness look at religion and go i don't even know where to start with y'all <laughs> i have no clue what what you're going to contribute to this conversation because you seem stuck on something that is so obviously uninclusive and and sort of like arbitrarily exclusive that I don't that, that it's hard to see how it fits in but I but but Alan I think is making a case that first of all religion has evolved contemporary thinkers who who have a who have a faith-based sensibility are not thinking the same way that we did during the Crusades that's not that's not we don't have to take we don't have to take the worst common denominator of religious believers you know the fundamentalist crazies and accept that their view of religion is the only one that they are the definition of religion why would we decide that why what how, how did they get the monopoly how did they when when did they get the authority to define christianity or islam for us why do we have to take their word for it? There's other people out there. <laughs> we don't have to listen to, we don't have to decide that that's, that that's who they are. So, but, the, but I think this is where I'm kind of trying to um, both interpret and also maybe anticipate a little bit Alan's thinking here. But, he, but, but what I hear is there's a collective, there's a shared sort of we are all neighbors foundational substrate to 
religion, and Alan comes out of the Christian tradition, so I think he's couching it in language that sounds Christian. Um, but this foundational substrate of collective uh, awareness that is vital and that we are losing and that we're the that our that our kind of like capitalistic freedom individualistic materialistic model is really kind of starting to get out of it's starting to go off the rails and we're and it's starting to and a little bit of that that remembrance of you know what we owe each other as a given what we owe the collective as a given bringing that back into our awareness um, it just feels huge it just feels huge so I'll keep reporting back and eventually this book will be released and you can read it yourself thanks for watching folks I appreciate you have a wonderful day I'll see you soon.